we are talking this weekend um, about how to grow a David heart. We have been for some months working through that part of the Bible which writes about our guide David more than any other person in the Bible, including Jesus. Did you know that? So when God devotes that much of his book to one topic, one theme, one person, I think he's saying, you know what? I've given you a lot of volume. I want you to really pay close attention to this stuff. And that's what we're going to do this weekend. We're going to talk about how to grow a heart that is in lifelong pursuit of God. One of the questions I hope becomes a standard in how you think about your own spirituality is this. Is my life blessable by God? Would you say that it is? Some of you, that might be kind of a, a new way that you're not really familiar with to say it. Is your life blessable by God? Is it in a place, is your heart working, your interior life working in such a way that you know the way that you're choosing to live is inviting the touch of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God, okay? It has nothing to do with God's love for us. God loves us whether we're naughty or whether we're nice. That's immaterial. His love is unconditional. But are we living our lives in a way that's blessable? Now, I think sometimes we make growing up in God way too, what, mystical? Just do 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 And we just think it's only for the super spiritual and we've got to do spiritual gymnastics and just kind of amp it up. Where is that in the Bible? If, if that's in the Bible, show me because I've missed that part. I think what I see in the Bible when I think about the people that really become, right? They are women and men who have a life forged because of consistent decisions of obedience to God. Remember how we defined obedience? Obedience is the only maturity that God recognizes. We have all kinds of other religious trappings that we think impress God. What really impresses God and invites the favor of God on our life is when we're taking regular steps, little and big, of obedience. That's the maturity he recognizes. So we're going to talk about putting our life in the way of his help, the way of his blessing, the way of his favor, cultivating a David heart, cultivating a life that lives in lifelong pursuit of him, okay? You may want to reach for your notes uh, that you received. We had hard copy when you came in, but also you can download them digitally on version if you want to go that route. They're accessible that way as well. By the way, going forward, know that if you're ever away for a weekend, you can always catch all of our uh, weekend gatherings in real time with live streaming online. Just want you to know that as well. Now, when we talk about growing a David heart and we think about David's life, one theme has consistently reemerged through the course of these months past, and it's this, that character is destiny. In other words, when we live the sum total of our life, providing that we have some time to look back on our life before we leave this earth, so, you know, we're not dying in an accident or whatever. And by the way, we're not worried about our death because our days are numbered by God. We accept that. We're not worried about the number of our days. We're worried about how we live these days. A mere number of years does not guarantee a well-lived life. It just guarantees you get old. It, the point is to live well, to live significantly, to live deeply and thoroughly. Character is destiny. When we look back on our life at the end of our days, what we will be, have become is largely linked directly to our character. Our character informs everything about us. That's why we need to grow a heart after God, just like David's heart. Remember, David was not all good and Saul was not all bad. The difference between the two men lay in what was the predominant core value of each man's life, what dominated each man's heart. I mean, you could argue that in sheer magnitude or frequency of sin, David way outdid Saul. I mean, think of just the Ten Commandments, right? The last half of the Ten Commandments. David broke them all. Do not steal, check. Do not lie, check. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, check. Do not commit adultery, check. Do not murder, check. Okay, so far, I mean, he's like totally a mess up, right? Yet at the end of his life, and this is going to seem like a dichotomy to you, this is going to mess you up a little bit. At the end of his life, looking back at the full scope of our lives, God looked back at David's life and said, I have found David, in spite of all the good, the bad, and the ugly, I have found David to be a man after my own heart. 
that will do all of my will in his own generation, fulfill the purpose for which I've created him. How could God say that in the face of so much downside behavior on David's life? Well, one of the reasons is this. One deed, one act, one sin on our part does not define a whole life. So thank God for grace, right? Because in a very real sense, all of us are much better than the worst thing we've ever done. And so if you've done a really bad thing, don't be stuck there for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, hating yourself because of that thing. You're probably already paying some version of consequence because of circumstances you put in motion by that decision. Receive God's amazing grace and be, a, in some sense, a wounded healer going forward, but don't be stuck there. Don't punish and penalize yourself all of your days. So character is destiny, and what I want to do is work through eight qualities. There are more, but these are from what you may consider some of the more obscure parts of the Bible in reference to David, but I'm going to tell you they are power-packed everyday life-giving truths. And we're going to work our way through those. Here's number one. Fill it in, would you? David had mercy for his enemies. If you're going to be a woman with a David heart, a man with a David heart, becoming a lifelong pursuer of God, we've got to cultivate a heart of mercy. Now, I have given you a load of Scripture, and so you can take that home in your devotional time and so forth, journaling. You can work through that part that we don't get to today. We just haven't got the time. So with each one of these qualities, I'm going to identify just one verse, read it to you, and then explain to you why that reinforces this David Hart virtue that we're pointing out in the time. And the first one uh, for mercy would be 2 Samuel chapter 1. Now, in 2 Samuel 1, something uh, tragic has happened for Israel that is really, really good for David. Saul dies, the king. It's on a place called Mount Gilboa. Now, most of you don't know where Mount Gilboa is. That's cool, but you do know where Mount Diablo is, right? If you don't, you've lived in the East Bay. I don't even know what to tell you, okay? Dude, you got issues. Whatever. Mount Gilboa is like one of the most central mountains. You can see it from anywhere in Israel. And Israel was once again having another epic battle with the Philistines, and Israel got dominated and right at the top of Mount Gilboa, in the heat of battle, the king himself, Saul and all of his sons, including Jonathan, that godly young man, David's best friend, Jonathan, they all die. And you know what David does? We see it in that passage I just referenced. David writes a funeral dirge, a, a, a lament of sorrow. He, he writes a poem of how sad he is for what has happened to these godly men and to the nation on that tragic dark day. Time out. What can he be thinking? Saul has been an assassin hot on David's heels for over a decade. The dude is dead now. Why would David be sad rather than, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has... I mean, just pumped... Like, if you had an assassin on your tail for a decade, like La Costa Nostra, you know, one of the dudes from, you know, the mafia and, and Sicily and just, you know, we're going to get the bullet and we're going to kill, the, you know, that whole kind of a deal. And the guy was killed, wouldn't you rejoice? David laments because even though Saul has cruelly tried to murder David for a decade, David gives Saul what he didn't deserve the very same thing God had given David and us multiple times, mercy. Notice his words. He says, how the mighty have fallen. How the mighty have fallen. Now, let me ask us a question this morning. If you and I had our enemy right where we wanted them, which means at our mercy, the question before us is this. Would we thrust in the knife to get even, to pay back, to revenge? Or would we give them in that moment what you and I have been given by God? Mercy. 
It takes a big person to give mercy in the face of treason and betrayal and assassination attempts. But if we're going to cultivate a heart after God, uh, we've got to, uh, and a David heart, we've got to begin to cultivate a heart that begins to work like heart, God's heart because God usually gives us human beings what we don't deserve. Uh, amazing grace and mercy and a second chance and a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth chance and a 27th chance and patience and kindness. And God says, all I'm asking is that you begin to let your heart work like my heart works towards you. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Be a mercy giver. That's what it means to grow a David heart, to be a God pursuer. Second quality we see in David, fill it in, is he was a devoted worshiper. Now, I do want you to join me in uh, this passage of Scripture and it's 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to read it to you. A couple sentences of context. So David is now the king. And um, a spiritual high watermark is happening for the nation. I mean, in the annals of the nation of Israel up to that moment, this is the biggest deal that's ever happened. It's like the Declaration of Independence meets the Constitution, meets the Revolutionary War victory over the British, meets the Civil War at Appomattox. I mean, just the whole deal. And that is the central focus of Israel's worship, that which was symbolic of the presence of God, was brought back to the capital city. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, some of you just gave me a puzzled look, okay? Think Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost ark. Yeah, kind of like that. The ark actually was a box of wood. That's what ark means in Hebrew, box. How about Noah's ark? You know what it was? It was Noah's box. That thing was not made for water skiing behind. It was made to just not sink, right? A box, same word. Ark of the covenant, Noah's ark, same deal. Made of acacia wood overlaid with gold, the lid had two angelic beings on top, and inside of it, symbolic of God's actions in the past on Israel's behalf, there was Aaron's rod that blossomed, there was the bull of manna, remember God fed him in the wilderness, and there was the Ten Commandments. And this ark of God had been kept uh, for really uh, decades in various homes throughout the land. Now for the first time, the king is bringing it back to the capital city, and David's erected a tent for it. He's going to put the, the ark, he's going to have the people put the ark in the tent. It's going to be their place of worship. Now one of the questions we might ask is, hey, Saul was king for 40 years. Why didn't he do this? Isn't that a good question? So the ark is coming back, and this is not kind of an obscure afterthought. This is a major celebration for the whole nation, and David is leading the charge. Check out verse number five. And David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, circle the words, with all their might. Did you get that? Now go down to verse number 13. And they went to the city of David uh, with rejoicing. That's the end of verse 12. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David wearing a linen ephod, that would be like a sort of a, a kingly garment, almost like a, a little simple lightweight bathrobe kind of a deal. Wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord. Now he's dancing with, note the words, circle them again, all his might. We'll come back to those. Verse 15, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. I told you, big deal. Verse 16, and as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, which is to say Jerusalem, notice, Michal is how you'd say her name in Hebrew, but I don't want to hurt myself, so I'm just going to call her Michael from now on, okay? Michael, the daughter of Saul, watched from a window. She's watching all this. This is David's wife. Did you get that? And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, notice, she despised him in her heart. Whose daughter is Michal? Saul's. Like father, like daughter. 
Let's pick it up at verse 17. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in the place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. David sacrificed offerings, etc., etc. Verse 18, he blessed the people. Verse 20, David returned home now to bless his own household. So he's coming back from the greatest moment in his life, the, the high water moment of being the king, a great victory for the nation, spiritually and otherwise. He walks in the door of his house, verse 20. And Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. How many of you know that is a major cold slap in the face? Her words are seething with scorn. This is an angry woman. Oh, yeah. Now, let me tell you, we haven't got time to get into it, but I'll tell you, she had some justification. David was by no means a model husband, definitely not by 21st century American standards, okay? But that's another teaching. Back to this. Distinguished himself today in front of the slave girls like any vulgar fellow. Verse 21, you know, David's having none of it, and he comes right back at her. David says to Michal, it was before the Lord, wife, who chose me rather than your dad or anybody from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. Notice the word undignified. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But those slave girls you spoke of, by them I will be held in honor. And then a very sad um, sort of endgame comment in verse 23. And Michael, Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Uh, to be a, a Hebrew woman in 1000 BC and to be childless was even more of a burden and sorrow and suffering and pain than uh, even in this day. Although there may be some ladies in the house this weekend uh, that you know uniquely what that's like to have the tremendous pain of you and your husband not being able to have children. And I want to say to you, in Jesus' name, I give you grace, and we pray for you, and I just want to say this. You know, the, the Bible clearly teaches that God gives all kinds of gifts, knowledge, understanding, including medical gifts. We live in the Bay Area with incredible medical knowledge, expertise, capacity, but some things are even beyond man's amazing medical accomplishments and I want you to know, many times in the Bible, people that could not have children were prayed for, and then they did have children. And I'm just simply saying, we will pray with you and for you as well, okay? And I want you to know that we love you. Michael wasn't just barren, however, uh, physically as a, as a woman, as a mom, but spiritually she settled deeply into an entrenched spirit of bitterness. That was Michal. Now, Several things are going on here. I want you to go back to the first part of the story, and you'll notice it says two times that David celebrated and worshiped the Lord with what? All his heart. Here's the question I have for us today. It's a challenging one. When's the last time you and I did that? Honestly, now. When's the last time? Now, don't think that what you heard me ask you is when did you go sprinting up and down the aisles, trailing banners and doing triple gainers and, you know, a good general cardiovascular workout? No, no, no. That has nothing to do with anything. Everybody has different dispositions, different temperament. The question is, when's the last time you truly worship God with all your heart, with total abandon, not worried what anybody else thought? And remember, this piece of worship that we have on weekends together in gatherings like this, where we sing for 15, 18, 20 minutes, that's only a small part of what worship is. Worship is the whole of our lives, right? Now, for those of you that are not a person yet, you're still considering the claims of Christ, but you haven't signed on the dotted line? That's cool. No problem. Take your time. We're with you. We're patient. We're just a safe place for you to grow and discover and become, okay, spiritually. For those of us that have made the commitment to believe, when is the last time we worship God with all of our heart? There's something else here. Did you notice the scorn in the comment, the specific wording that Michal chose to address her husband with? 
how you have distinguished yourself. What she was really saying is, you have shamed the throne. You have shamed yourself. You have shamed this house. You have shamed me, okay? Now, Michael was the daughter of Saul, and what was one of Saul's big blind spots? Saul was tremendously insecure. Saul governed, and we've had some political leaders and presidents in the past, it seems to us. By the way, it's a lot easier job to sit in the stands watching the 22 guys on the football field try to play a good game rather than be in the pocket with 800-pound linemen trying to destroy it. Same thing politically. It's easy to think how the guy or gal sitting at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But some politicians lead like this at the beginning of every day. They never seem to have a center. And you say, well, John, that's the only way they retain power is to jump on what's currently in and to go for the biggest voter block and play to this constituent base and that constituent base. That is an option. I'm still not buying it. So when we look at this, Saul's center was something he was constantly doing this for because Saul was obsessed with other people's opinions. Uh, the Bible says this about other people's opinions, that the fear of man is a snare. You know what a snare is? A snare is a trap. A snare is a wire kind of in a slip knot that when the animal walks through on the trail and puts their foot through and continues to try to walk, the more they struggle against the snare, the tighter it pulls until they are trapped immovably. And that's what happens to us when we're playing our lives like this. I wonder what people think about me today. I wonder what they'll think if I do this. I wonder what they'll think if I do that. And I'm saying to you, Love other human beings. Respect where they're coming from. Respect them as human beings of value just because. Treat them with gracious courtesy. We're not making any statement about that. But we've got to have a deep center that says, I will worship the Lord. And what other people think, whether I'm undignified, humiliated, or it, it's immaterial to me. I will love God with all my heart. I'm not going to play to the grandstand, play to the crowds, play to people's opinions. I live my life for an audience of one, and it's him. David was a devoted worshiper, and he had this deep center now. Before we talk about Michal, just a little bit more. Did you know Saul had another daughter, Michal's older sister, Mirab? She was the one offered to David after he killed Goliath, you may remember. Remember the guy that killed Goliath, the king said, would be tax-free? and would get the king's daughter or princess's wife. David rejected Merab. At the same time, when you look at that passage in 2 Samuel, it says, and Michael, daughter of Saul, was in love with David. One of the things about David's life that confuses me and is really a dark side I'm not going to pretend to understand, Merab married another man named Adriel. They had five sons. And many years down the line, and I can't fully understand the reason, David allowed those five sons to be put to death. Let's go to Michael. Uh, Michael's kind of a tragic figure to me. It's kind of a bummer to be second line in anything, and she was a clear second line, getting her older sister's hand-me-down. She was deeply in love with this valiant, love, uh, this valiant man of God, David. She was also used by her father. When Saul heard that his daughter Michael was now in love with David, he was glad, but here's why Saul was glad. He wasn't glad because he said, good, now my beautiful daughter whom I love will be well cared for, treasured, honored, treated with, with love, and so forth. His words were in the Bible, now it's good that Michael loves David because she will become a snare to him. There's that word again. A snare, meaning a trap. He was manipulating his daughter as nothing more than a pawn in his insecure political game as king, right? And he was constantly trying to maneuver every uh, advantage he could to make sure David never gained the throne. He was holding on at that point with Saul with all of his might. So she ends up bitter and barren, and this is not a doctrine, but I just want to offer this by way of observation. You know what psychosomatic illness is? So psycho, mind, soma, body. It's a big deal in America. A lot of people have made themselves psychosomatically ill. In other words, when we are so internally unwell, 
emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, we can make ourselves physically ill. Some of you have maybe experienced the difficulty and challenge. And the doctor says, medically, you're fine, so why do you feel so poorly? And, you know, there's depression and a whole other realm of symptoms and sufferings. Okay, that being said, I want us to think about Michael's life and how she ended her day as bitter and barren. And I just want to ask the question, was she bitter because she was barren? Was she barren because she was bitter? Is it a little bit of both? Um, it's one thing to have barrenness of body, which apparently she had, but then to have barrenness of spirit, barrenness of soul, which it appears she also had. Sometimes by the way we think and the vengeances we coddle and nurse, nurse in our soul, we can imprison ourselves in a very small, toxic, hostile world, mentally and emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. Michael seems to have let this happen to her the same way that her father's heart worked. For those of you that are moms and dads, fathers and mothers, can I say to you that our children are going to become so much like us? And before you say, John, that's not a fair statement. Well, I don't know how fair it is, but it's definitely true. And if your children begin to model behaviors, I mean, who else are they supposed to become? Hello? Uh, if your children are beginning to model behaviors in your home that you say, man, that's, not a, that's destructive, that's unhealthy, take a hard look in the mirror and say, God, what must I change to be able to put the unhealthy example I've set before my children to a healthy example? So Saul's quit producing Michal's. David was a fully devoted worshiper. Number three, he was unselfishly kingdom-minded unselfishly kingdom-minded. In 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, David is at the apex of power. He's sitting in his palace one day, and he makes this statement. I've listed it there for you. Here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. You know it's in a tent because we've already studied that together this morning. What does it mean David says, I'm in a palace of cedar? That's where he lived as the king. When you're in a rocky country like Israel, Trees and wood are a, at a minimum and a real value, and especially cedar wood, which was usually imported from Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon. Have you heard that phrase in uh, writings of antiquity and so forth? So David was living in high-end digs, and here he is asking a question he did not have to ask. What kind of a heart asks a question like this? Here I am living in a palace of cedar and the ark of God is in a tent. You know what kind of a heart asks that question? A heart after God's own heart. That's what it means to cultivate a David heart. We're thinking about doing the right thing um, even, be, even when we don't have to, even if nobody else notices. We do the right thing because it's the right thing and because we know it greatly honors and glorifies God. That's what it means to grow a David heart, a heart in lifelong pursuit of him, asking the hard questions that we never even have to ask. Now, you know David wasn't allowed to build the temple, right? He was a man of blood. He was a warrior. Solomon would, but what did David do? He spent the last part of his life amassing all the invaluable raw materials so that when Solomon assumed the throne, everything would be ready for the construction of the magnificent temple to happen, right? Let's close out point three here by giving kind of a leadership lesson for those of you that are in servant leadership or long to be in servant leadership. By the way, that's not just in the church. If you're in kind of any leadership role at your company, management, you lead a team, you lead a group, I don't care if there's just one or two other people involved, whatever, you need to be thinking about things like this. The last great task of servant leaders is the baton pass a transition. And there are two kinds of leaders that pass the baton, secure leaders and insecure leaders. Uh, secure leaders are thinking about the interests of God. Secure leaders uh, understand that the entrustments which I've attempted to steward are not mine. They are not I own. They are only on loan. 
So as I go forward in this transition, the secure godly servant leader is saying, I've got to be much more concerned about the interests of God and the interests of the kingdom of God and the interests of eternity than I am the things the insecure leaders obsessed with at transition time. Because they pass the baton, but you have to rip their fat, stubby little fingers off the baton. Because what they're concerned with is perpetuating their reputation, their image, their legend, and holding on and getting all they can out of that power position. The secure servant leader is thinking about empowering the next generation to win big in God. These are the things we think about. These are the things we do if we're going to grow a David heart. Here's number four, fill it in. He had a humble and eternal perspective. You can tell a lot uh, about a person by their prayer. And in 2 Samuel 7, listen to the first sentence in David's prayer. Again, he's at the top of his game as king, and he asks this question, who am I? Sovereign Lord. Do you have that kind of a maturity just kind of pouring out of your essence? Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm not talking about have some kind of self-loathing or some kind of a, a weird psychological self-hate. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a humility that is based in a healthy, clear perspective, right? Right? Now, you say, John, when you say perspective, what do you mean? Let me give you a working definition of perspective. Perspective is an accurate view of things. There's the first part. A lot of times we go through life with skewed views, inaccurate views. Um, I do a lot of reading, and one of the things I read every day are the editorials. And I'm amazed at all these good-hearted people suffering from all the kinds of common things that happen in life and many times, not always, but many times, they have an inaccurate view of what's really going on here. So when you're seeing things fuzzy, then you behave fuzzy. When you see things unhealthy, skewed, whatever, you begin to behave unhealthy. Perspective, on the other hand, is an accurate view of things, watch this, in their true relationship of relative importance. In other words... That is to say, an eternal context. Is that beginning to happen in your heart as you think about your life, relationships, work, finance, future, all those things? David was humble. Who am I? And he had an eternal perspective. Number five, fill it in. He was a passionate prayer. A passionate prayer. In 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, both of those passages say the same thing. Can we ever learn from this? Watch this. The Bible says in both those contexts that David, uh, in essence, was given by the Lord great victory. So the Lord gave David victory because David inquired of the Lord. I'm going to ask how often that inquiring of the Lord peace is happening uh, in our lives these days. Now, some of you are thinking, John, Sunday morning, dude, you're asking a lot of hard questions. You're killing me. Yeah, I know. i got to do this four times. <laughs> how often are we inquiring of the Lord? Even the great Moses, did you ever notice why he was kept out of the promised land? You know, it's windy at the top. It's tough to be a servant leader because there's a much finer margin of error but he struck the rock for a second time when he should have spoken to it. In other words, he tried to bring about the same spiritual results with the same old methods. And what God is saying, you know what? I don't want you to re learn to rely on your religious fallback position or your denominational deal. Fooey to that stuff. Be fresh and open to me each and every time. Inquire of me each and every time, and I will help you. So you know what we do as human beings, and especially if you're kind of hardwired as a type A like I am. Don't look at me like I'm a freak. There's some more type A's out there in the house. What we do is we plan. And then to make sure our plans are sound, we do some research, man. I do, we, we do market analysis. 
and then we strategize, and then we analyze, and then we make these projections. Okay, there's nothing inherently wrong with those, providing that at the beginning, at the end, we do this. We inquire of the Lord. You say, well, how quick does that happen? I don't know. It's wait on the Lord. Days, weeks, months. There are so many big decisions floating around in my life. I try to live in a constant place of blessableness by God and of listening to the voice of God in my life. Not an audible voice, but the Spirit who lives within us gives us clear direction and, and clear leadings if we're paying attention, and then we'll know. Are you these days, like David, a passionate prayer, inquiring of the Lord? Um, because then we can align our lives with his timing and his ways. Here's number six. Fill it in. He had compassion toward the innocent. Again, when he didn't have to, he asks a really penetrating question. Look at it in 2 Samuel 9. He's musing in his palace one day. He says, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, when was the last time that you were just chilling in your house and you begin to muse about how you could bless the offspring of your enemy? When's the last time that happened for you? Yeah, me too. Not very much. God, today, how could I bless the offspring of my enemy? God, they're as evil as he is. Kill him. Just remove him from the earth. Hallelujah. In love, of course. And here's David musing about how he can bless the offspring of his mortal enemy, Saul, and his best friend, Jonathan. There emerges a name. Because remember, on Mount Gilboa, in the heat of battle, Saul and his sons are killed. Remember Saul's spiritual drift, oldest son, Jonathan, which means lover of God. Third son, Malkishua, means lover of Baal. What kind of drift happened in the heart of King Saul? But that notwithstanding, there is a grandson alive, actually a son of Jonathan, David's best friend. The guy's name is Mephibosheth. Don't try to say that you'll hurt yourself, okay? Mephibosheth. Now, the thing that was unique about Mephibosheth is he apparently had a very severe physical disability, right? David finds out that this Mephibosheth is living, and he has him brought to the palace, and he says, Mephibosheth, you are the grandson of the king and the son of my best friend. Eat all the days of your life at the table of your king. And he gives him this extremely generous uh, invitation of hospitality, which Mephibosheth does. I mean, cool, never have to cook again. Eat at the table of the king. That dude eats well. I'm in, right? So all David has done is give generosity and good. If you follow the story through, and I've given you all the biblical trail in your notes and so forth and online, you will find when David was run out of the capital city of Jerusalem by his own son Absalom, we'll be looking at that, by the way, guys, in June and fatherhood, and manhood, and so forth. Mephibosheth stays behind and commits treason against the very man that, you've heard the adage, don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's exactly what he did. He committed treason and betrayal. He stayed behind in the city. David is running for his life, and Mephibosheth starts getting political allies that will support he, Mephibosheth, to be the king uh, as his grandfather Saul was king. He was so seductive in his words, he even got Joab. Do you remember Joab? Joab was David's commanding general of the army of Israel. He also betrayed David and sided with Mephibosheth. Read the story, it's amazing. Okay. Mephibosheth ended tragically, by the way. Watch this. If you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Here's my question for us. Have you ever had a moment in life or a period in your life where you have done nothing genuinely, legitimately, really good and kind to another and they've committed treason against you? They've gone viral. They've gone on social media, cruel. They've gone whatever. And they've just tried to destroy you for your goodness. What in that moment has been your visceral response? Kill them! Okay. 
we've got to put that aside and we've got to say, God, if I get on the trail of vengeance, if I try to bottle up all their hatred and stop them from hurting me, I am going to become as consumed with hatred and revenge as they appear to be toward me. In the name of God and by your amazing grace, I let it go. You say, John, life doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't work that way, but it should. Jesus modeled this for us. We can't possibly pay back everybody that hurt us. And at some point, we've got to get over wanting to pay other people back because Jesus said, bless those that what? Curse you. Bless, not curse, bless those who despitefully use you and rise above it. I will give you grace to do that. And remember this, at the end of the day, God keeps good books. Let's not be people of payback. Let's be people that give good for evil. I know it can't be done in and of our own ability. God will help us. So compassion toward the innocent, number seven, financially generous toward God's work. Now, we're not going to take any time here because we spent the last three weekends really unpacking David's extreme financial generosity toward the things of God. So please don't forget what we talked about. Please remember it. Please act upon that financial truth as revealed in Holy Scripture. Remember this when we talk about David and his finance because he began as an impoverished eighth son who was this little ragtag farm boy, shepherd boy. Was David generous because he was wealthy or was he wealthy because he was generous? He was wealthy because he was generous. And I'm wondering if you and I are flowing in a life of material generosity. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. We cannot outgive our extravagant God. Are we free-flowing conduits of his blessing to other people and to a needy world? Or are we damming up the blessing and hoarding it up, trying to create a reservoir so we can get all we can and can all we get and we can keep it all because we intuitively become hoarders? God says, no, don't be a hoarder. Be a releaser. Be a free-flowing channel that I can give you my trust, my character, my influence, my stuff, and I know that I can trust you enough that it will flow through your life to bless other people in my name. And in the course of that, you also will be blessed. Number eight, let's wrap it up. Fill it in, would you? Moral purity. Now, some of you scoff and you say, John, have you lost your mind? (laughs) Moral purity. David was a royal mess up when it came to moral purity. Yeah, he was. Oh, boy. How many of you would feel totally comfortable right now if all of your dark secrets could be on these screens? How many of you would enjoy that? Let me see your hand. Because you can okay. We have a couple people. Maybe you didn't hear the question right, okay? (laughs) I'm working with you. Here's the point. David's dirty laundry has been exposed for all the world to see for 3,000 years. When you're the king and you do naughty things, everybody's going to know. When you're the president and you do naughty things, everybody's going to know. I found private citizens that live mostly obscure lives do about the same amount of naughtiness, but they just don't have the platform. And so they can do not naughtiness incognito, naughtiness subterranean. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. None of us got our whole act together, right? Here's why I say moral purity for David. Because one act, one deed, one sin does not define a life. And it was God that pronounced, looking at the whole of David's life, that this is a man after my own heart. I didn't say that. You didn't say that. God said that about David. So that means that God must be able to look at the whole of our life, not one sordid moment, the whole of our life, and say, you know what? That is a child after my own heart. I'm saying don't write yourself off because God has not written you off. Let's look at the last uh, scripture supporting this eighth quality of heart. Uh, Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. It's kind of funny. I like funny parts of the Bible because they're real, they're honest, they're so human, sometimes ridiculous. 
I'm in 1 Kings 1. Let me read it to you. I'm just reading four verses. When King David was old and well advanced in years, he could not keep warm even when they put covers over him. You know what that means? The dude's got low blood pressure. You ever live with an older person? I grew up on the farm. I was 12 and my grandma was 88. The woman was killing me. She had low blood pressure. The house was 117, okay? <laughs> low blood pressure. He could not keep warm even when they put covers on him. So his servants said to him, let us look for a young virgin to attend the king and take care of him. Now, to say a young virgin, what that means in, in a Hebraic mindset, it's not speaking about her sexual history or lack thereof. It is saying an unmarried woman. That's what that means, a young virgin. Okay, now notice. Uh, she can attend the king, take care of him. She can lie down beside him so that our Lord the king may keep warm. Right. Yeah, that's going to happen. Okay, look at verse 3. Then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful girl, and alas, they found her. Abishag, a Shunammite, brought her to the king, and the girl was very beautiful. She took care of the king and waited on him, but the king had no intimate relations with her. Now, let's be real. We're adults, right? David at 75 or whatever he is uh, does not have the same pounding testosterone that he had at 25. Uh, David's life went south when he seduced Bathsheba and moral failure invited into David's life and family profoundly painful consequence. I think what's happening here, because the Bible takes pain to say, and the king had no intimate relations with her. Davy Gravy has learned his lesson. And he's saying, I'm not touching her with a 10-foot pole. She can get in bed with me, but stay on the other side, just so the heat kind of emanates. By the way, that was a common thing that would happen. They called them courting boards. I could go into American Puritan history, but I'd bore you to death. In, in, in days of antiquity, Abe Lincoln and others, when you don't have central heating and you live in little 16 by 16 foot soddies and it's 27 below outside, you know, you get desperate for anything warm that'll kind of keep you warm on long, bitter, cold nights. That's all it was with the king. But David responded to this beautiful young woman with moral virtue. You see what I'm saying? This too is growing a David heart. We'll talk more next time. Would you stand to your feet with me? We're going to wrap it up in prayer. I want to say a couple things to you. If you need to talk to anybody today, uh, somebody that might have a moment to share with you, visit with you, be available for you, on either side of the platform here, we have an I raised my hand area, and those are available for you. Just want you to know that, okay? Um, want to also say if you're a guest with us, we have some of our servant leaders in the classrooms on this side of the campus. Any questions you may have, we're here to serve you and help you kind of get familiar with what's available to care for you and your family. Any way that we can serve you, let us know. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Father God, we really want a heart like David's, minus some of the really bad decisions. We don't want to put our life in such a hole, God, that it takes us decades to dig out, even though you've given us amazing grace. God, for these beautiful people, I look at their beautiful faces and I see such potential, such possibility, such a wonder, such perfection, such goodness. God, would you work through this people? Help each man and woman, boy and girl, exactly where they are in life and that these eight virtues of heart can become their own and that they will be a candidate because their life is now blessable as they become a lifelong pursuer of you. For we ask all this stuff in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. I love you guys. See you next time. Bye-bye.